It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Kurai GP01. The OSD is controlled by a little joystick at the rear of the screen, towards the right side is viewed from the front. If you hold that down for a few seconds that's how you can power the monitor off, and if you just briefly press it then you can turn it back on again. If you press the joystick to the left without entering the main menu system, then you can quickly adjust the volume of anything connected to the 3.5mm jack. This monitor doesn't include integrated speakers, by the way. Press it to the right, then you can adjust the brightness. And then left and right, by the way, to then adjust the slider here. If you press the joystick down without entering the main menu, then you can select a crosshair design. You press left and right to cycle through the different crosshairs. Red and green, various different designs. Just the design shown here, you can't customise the crosshair further. You can't change the position, it's always in the centre of the screen. If you want to then get rid of the crosshair that's on the screen, you can press the joystick up. Alternatively, you can press the joystick down, which will also get rid of it. If you press the joystick up on its own, when there's no crosshair on the screen or anything like that, then you can get into the main menu. You can also get into the main menu by just pressing the joystick when there's nothing else on the screen, in terms of the OSD, that is. So I'm not a huge fan of how they've laid this out. It has many different layers to it. So let's say I wanted to change the green color channel. I'd have to go to color temp here. You can press the joystick in to select that, or alternatively, you can press the joystick in the down direction. You then have to select user, and then I'd have to go to green, and then you can move the joystick left or right to change the slider. But the fact you have to go so deep into the menu just to change something like that is to be honest, not the best way of laying it out. There should really be all of this on the screen at once, so you can easily see everything and quickly change the thing that you want to change. Just a small gripe, once you've set everything up, it's not really a problem. Speaking of setting everything up before going any further, I'm going to address the question, what are the best settings for this monitor? By best settings, I mean the settings which I used in the review. According to my own preferences, they worked on my unit and they worked according to the colorimetric targets which I go for in reviews. The best settings for everyone will be different depending on your individual preferences and also your unit. So these are just a suggestion. So the first thing to be aware of is the mode, so they're the presets of the monitor. I'd recommend standard or standard as they've called it here, but it should say standard. The other preset, so let's say I select movie, that's really bright and it has a cooler tint. If I then go on to display, you'll see that brightness and contrast are greyed out. There is a DCR, dynamic contrast ratio feature, which you can turn on or off, or it looks like you can, but if you change this, either on or off, then it just goes back to the standard preset. It's the same for the others, FPS, RTS, they just make different adjustments. iSaver's a little bit different, so that again blocks out the brightness and contrast, but it's different in that the adjustments it makes are actually somewhat unique. Gives you a warmer look to the image. It is an effective low blue light LBL setting. You might like to use this for more relaxing viewing in the evening for example, but the fact it knocks off the brightness control is a bit awkward to be honest. That isn't really something that you should be blocking off when it comes to a setting that can help optimize viewing comfort because everyone has their own different preferences in that respect. So again for general use I recommend standard. That gives you full flexibility. You can then go to display and you can change the brightness. I had mine set to 78. That gets me around 160 nits, which is a target I go for for consistency in my reviews, suits my lighting environment, etc. Contrast 50, that's the default. A few other settings I changed were in game mode. OD, overdrive, set that to normal. Well, that's what I'd recommend, at least for high refresh rates. If you are spending a lot of time and you're using VRR at lower refresh rates or you're setting the monitor to static 60Hz, for example, I'd actually recommend setting the overdrive to off because otherwise there's a lot of overshoot. It's very strong. Otherwise, though, yeah, normal, I'd say, works pretty well. FreeSync Premium, if you want to use adaptive sync, then you have to have this set to on. So that means you could use AMD FreeSync or you could use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode, for example. It does say when you enable FreeSync technology, flickers may be recognized in some gaming conditions. I didn't notice any flickering on this model with my RTX 3090. I think that is just a general thing that all Kurai monitors probably say, and some of them probably do flicker. Certainly some of their VA models I'd expect to flicker during VRR in certain situations. So it's probably just a general message. It's not something to worry about. The other thing I changed in the monitor OSD was in color temp. Set this to user. And then you've got the red, green, and blue color channels. 
Red, I set to 50, which is the default in the user setting. Green is 48, and blue is also 48. So that's just what worked on my unit. Again, it's not going to be perfect for all units. This got close to 6,500k, my usual white point target, with a good neutral green channel. You may want to use the sRGB setting, which is an sRGB emulation mode. You might also see there's DCI-P3. I'll come on to that shortly. That isn't a DCI-P3 emulation mode because this monitor's color gamut is nowhere near DCI-P3. But sRGB does clamp the gamut. So there's really very little, if any, over coverage of sRGB, but there was some under coverage. Natively, the gamut isn't massive on this monitor, but it does extend a bit beyond sRGB in some regions. So this just tones that down. It just tames the gamut a little bit. You might want to use that. You can adjust the brightness with the sRGB setting, so that's a good flexibility to have, but you can't adjust the contrast. You can't adjust colour either because that would mean setting that to user. You can't adjust the colour channels, I should say. You can also adjust gamma. There are two gamma settings, gamma 1 and gamma 2, with gamma 1 being closer to, well on my unit, at least closer to 2.2 and gamma 2 being closer to 2.4 on average. So yes, you might prefer sRGB, otherwise if you want to change the color channels and just use the native gamut, you can select user. I did say I was going to mention the DCI-P3 setting. I might as well mention it here. It's not what I consider a best setting, but it is something which some people might like to use because it does give a bit of a more saturated look to the image. It's interesting, actually, because unlike some saturation boosts, which are really quite heavy handed and strong, it doesn't crush the shade variety. It's more selective than that, but it also doesn't expand the gamut, so it's anywhere near DCI-P3. So you don't get those kind of saturation levels that you'd actually get from DCI-P3. It really is just a filter, quite an interesting filter, and some people might like how it looks. It just does give a bit more of a deep, or somewhat more saturated look to certain shades, a bit of a punchier look overall. Not good for color accuracy, regardless of the color space you're working in, but it's just something which you may subjectively like. But as I recommended, I'm sticking to user, made a few adjustments there, changed the brightness, made sure OD was set to normal, and turned on AMD FreeSync so I can use Adaptive Sync. So that's under SDR. Under HDR, there's not really much you can change, but I'll show you that anyway. So I've now got HDR active in Windows. You'll see a lot of the menus greyed out now. You can't change brightness, for example. You can't access the color temp menu, so you can't change the color channels. You can't change the gamma setting, that's also greyed out, so really very restricted in what you can do. OD is greyed out, but it will set that to whatever you were using under SDR, whatever you'd set it under SDR, will be used under HDR as well, even though the controller is greyed off for some reason. If you go to other, you'll see that gamma is greyed out as well. The other thing you might have noticed, in game mode, there's also an HDR setting. This is just something you can set to auto or off. If you have it set to off, it means it'll ignore the fact the monitor's being fed an HDR signal and won't actually activate its HDR mode. If you have it set to auto, then when it's fed an HDR signal, it will use its HDR mode. If it's fed an SDR signal, it will switch that off as you'd expect. Go back to normal SDR operation. Look at the remaining settings now. So DCR dynamic contrast ratio, I mentioned that briefly, but if you enable this, it will allow the backlight to adjust according to the content on the screen. And it adjusts as one unit. There's no local dimming or anything like that. Having used this a little bit with various different scenes, different wallpapers and in-game, etc., it looks like it adjusts at a reasonably rapid pace, a moderate pace, I should say, but it doesn't ever go particularly dark. It doesn't seem to want to dim an awful lot, and it does indeed block off your brightness control and contrast. So it's pretty inflexible and not really particularly effective as far as dynamic contrast settings go, although I don't generally like dynamic contrast settings anyway, so not a huge loss. Next you've got language, so you can change the language that the OSD is displayed in. Game mode, I've been through most of these settings except timer, so yes, there's an on-screen timer. You can set that to various different times, 30, 40, 50, 60, or 90 minutes. That just gives you a little timer, you can see there at the top left. Can't change the position of the timer. And also note that if you've got the crosshair active, then the timer disappears, so you can't have the crosshair and the timer active at the same time. Next you've got modes, been through them. Colour temp, been through most of these. Warm I didn't mention. Well, that is not warm actually on my unit. It is very similar to the standard setting. In fact, it appears to be entirely identical to the standard setting. So if you want to be using a low blue light setting, really your only option, through the OSD at least, 
is setting the mode to eye saver. I should have mentioned before as well, it has quite a nice neutral look to it. It has an amber look, a warm look, and it has a somewhat reduced green channel as well, so it doesn't have a strong green or yellowish tint as some settings of this type do have. So it's better balanced visually, it's just a shame that it locks off your brightness. And the other option there was cool, and that gives you a higher white point if you want a cool look to the image. Alternatively, you could achieve that by reducing the red colour channel, for example, with the user setting. There's an aspect setting, that's only available if you disable adaptive sync. So you disable free sync premium in the OSD, which I've just done. So you can see the aspect setting is now available. There's a 16 by 9 and 4 by 3 or automatic. So the auto setting will look at your source resolution and should set the aspect ratio accordingly. 16 by 9 will stretch it so it fits the entire screen, which is 16 by 9, and 4 by 3 will enforce a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. Next is input. You can select the input used by the monitor. HDMI 1, HDMI 2, HDMI port 1, HDMI port 2, or display port. Other. So there's the gamma setting, which I mentioned before, and just to reiterate the fact that this is, on my unit at least, around 2.2 using gamma 1 and 2.4 using gamma 2. Power off, if you want to automatically power the monitor off after a minute. Seems quite restrictive. Not sure why you wouldn't just turn it off yourself, but okay, you can do that. And volume, which is another way of changing the volume of anything connected to the 3.5mm headphone jack. And there's reset which will allow you to reset everything to the factory default, which I don't want to do. So I mentioned towards the start of this video, I didn't much like the way that the menu has so many layers to it, so it could take a while to get to the setting you want. Another thing I don't like is that there's nothing showing the refresh rate and indeed the resolution that you're currently running. So it can be a little bit annoying. There's no indication that VRR is actually working on the monitor itself and doing its thing. There's no kind of frame rate display or refresh rate display. And because it doesn't display the resolution, sometimes it can be a bit confusing as to whether the GPU is handling the scaling or whether the monitor is handling the scaling if you're running at a non-native resolution. Although the giveaway, if you're a PC user with an NVIDIA GPU, so I've got full HD 165 hertz selected and I've got it set to no scaling, perform scaling on display. So it's going to try and use the display scaler to handle the scaling where possible, except the monitor doesn't support scaling at 165 hertz or 144 hertz. So there's no scaling going on, or really it's the GPU doing one-to-one -one scaling more accurately. So they're in the PC resolution list. If, however, I look at the Ultra HD HD SD list, the monitor does support scaling here. So up to 120 hertz, it should now fill the screen up completely because the monitor scaler is taking over and doing its thing. So anyway, that is all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Kurai GP01. Be sure to check out the full review, and there's a link to that in the description of the video alongside information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, they are nice ways of showing your support.